Right then. Space. Where we left off after our last suborbital flight. To not quite space. And launch a ship, 2,000 bucks. Almost like space. And launch. Yep, that, those occurred. Those were contracts. So, Gian here at the mission control room. Very good. So, we could grab more contracts of things that are easy to test. For example, Use an SRB while landed. Obviously, I'm going to accept that. That's, I'm going to launch another ship that will contain boosters. Uh, test a stacked coupler and fly to Herpin. Hmm. Give me. Do you have any specific parameters here? Uh, between 7.4 and 14.9 kilometers. Within a speed envelope of 280 to 680. I, th I think that'll come up in my ordinary flight profile, and I have quite a while to get the test to occur. It, this contract lasts an entire year. I have ages to figure out how to get that incorporated into the flight profile. Alright, seriously, Ops, like, really, I'm, I'm concerned about your attempts to record <laughs> this. Just don't. <laughs> How fast does in-game time pass here? Um, uh, in-game time is, is kind of real time, but with the ability to compress time when you are in okay. deep space far away from things. So that, like Space missions take about the real amount of time that they would to go those distances. Like Getting into orbit take around Kerbin takes an hour. You have half-hour orbital periods up there. Getting to Mun and back takes a couple of days. Getting to Juna, which is which is Kerbal Mars, that takes months and months of flying. Okay. However, you can also have multiple missions going at once, so we could, if we were going to send something to Juna, get it set up and on its path, and then leave it there and do other things yeah, for the six sense. months it will take it to get there. Uh, test Mark 16 parachute in flight over Kerbin. Yeah, that, I can probably satisfy that during a descent. So just, all of those will go on the pile. And now, the most important thing that was accomplished out of that test mission is we got some science. Science can be spent to unlock new parts, like like decouplers and mystery goo. Mystery Mr. goo is a trademarked substance. Mystery. <laughs> I, I'm not sure if mystery goo or just goo is the trademark here. Hmm. But, but it is goo, and uh, some additional oh, fuel tanks of different sizes. Freaks. Different sizes of fuel tanks are very important for finally tuning your, your spacecraft as they get built. And then, let's see, I got, I got 19 science left, which would be enough to buy survivability, which would give us this engine, which is a pretty good one. It's uh, low th lower thrust but higher efficiency, so that's one you'd use for maneuvering in space. Also, radial parachutes and landing legs. Pretty handy, just these basic tiny landing legs. Or I could pick up stability to get nose cones, winglets, and radial decouplers. It's a good question. Uh, survivability, I like that engine is very useful in the 909. Uh, we'll get the other things later. That will lead into flight control, which would give us access to our first uh, our first probe module for running unmanned missions. And the inline reaction wheel, or going after after science, science of of science, which uh, unlocks another experimental dealie for gathering science, better antenna for transmitting science, batteries to give us more. Electrical capacity on a spaceship holds two quad A batteries for a maximum of 100 <laughs> of charge. Uh, those will be the, the fruits of other missions. Also, from the from the science menu. So the way the science system works is you have essentially all of space divided up into biomes and like overall fields of influence, and then in each of those you can perform 
all manner of experiments. From like right now, we just have access to the basic. Any any crew that you send out can perform reports either from within their module or by stepping outside and doing EVAs. And also, every time that you recover a vessel that has been somewhere, you get science out of that. We've also added the mm -hmm. mystery goo to the list of things we can do. But basically, each biome has a certain amount of science that can be learned from it, from all of those different experiments. And so, what you do in pursuit of more science is try to bring more things to new places. Makes sense. Such as space. Space is always a new place. And of course, in general, the farther away you are, the more science there is to be had. Like a very cost-effective way to get a relative shitload of science early on is to just briefly push yourself away from Kervin into what is technically outside its sphere of influence and governed by the sun, and then you, you're in crazy land and can get all manner of... all kinds of science, as it were. So let's see. Actually, now that now that this is the case, I can put tiny decoupler right the hell up there. And I won't need multiple parachutes if I'm just bringing back the capsule. And I can attach goo for learning highly scientific goo. Yes, those are two single-use, fairly valuable, experimental things that can be used to gather data. Most helpful. And so, under that up. So that upper section, with the little high-efficiency engine there, that will hopefully be used when we are already in space for a little bit of maneuvering. And so now, under that, I am going to build the thing what will lift us off the planet. Which is now much more easily done ergonomic wise because we have larger fuel tanks to work with. So we're not stringing as many parts together. Full stupid. Alright. Now we don't have radial decouplers yet, so. Magnifying the amount of power that we're throwing out is still just gonna be a matter of building a single giant homogenous stack of parts. Which is a little tricky when everything is wedged right up against itself. Maybe throw some more support struts into things. The modular girder segments. Highly useful. Highly durable, as we learned from our first test flight. Yes. Right, there's there's going to be a lot of wobble from these. As they, I, can, I can probably work to mitigate that by dividing my subsidiary engines up among multiple girders. And, hmm. Thought occurs. I, I, I want to jury rig these into being in line, separate, separatable, even though they're not quite. Is that all right? That is invalid. I need to put some kind of tiny basic part. All right, things to calm down, but I don't want. Hmm? Hello. Take round. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Space is underway. How do you feel about space? I'm not... I don't feel about space. Alright, I'm on the verge of jury rigging something here that will... Yes! Acceptable. So I have successfully finangled my way into what is effectively a radial decoupler by just having little tube bits out on the ends of these scaffolds and then I will hang more engines off of them. Hmm. Such that I will be able to discard these as I up. And hopefully, uh, like high in the sky, it may even be possible to get the fuel in these little outboard bits into the middle and burned properly. Who knows? Anything could happen. Such is space. This is already a quite finaglerous one. Based on principles understood by man. So, yeah, is that is not it really? right? Allegedly. That's what my backers tell me. We'll let's, see. Let's discard this ghost fuel tank since it's getting in the way of my ability to see things. Uh, 
Come on. Come on. Well, almost had it. For just a frame. There. I may, in fact, not actually want to talk right now, so... Uh... Rest yourself. Yeah. All right. Later. All right. That... This is a construct. It's an assemblage yeah. of material things. <laughs> okay, so engine staging. Let's let's figure this out. So stage one. All these fuckers down here need to be lit. All of them. Uh, where's the middle? There's the middle. All of you fuckers gonna light and do some shoving. So next stage, yes, these decouplers here snap, because these little tanks will be the first to burn out. Then, those guys up there will want to snap, because these will last marginally longer. And then, way down the line, this will break off, revealing that engine. I want to add an extra stage that is between... I don't want the parachute to deploy the moment I discard this, because I'm probably going to discard that while in the upper atmosphere or something. Just for a layer of control. Right, I was supposed to test SRBs. I should do that. I should incorporate SRBs into this somehow. For the investors. Um, to this thing. So we have a contract for this. We should do something to that effect. Uh, yes. Uh. <laughs> there. <laughs> SRBs for testing. Sure. <laughs> On ground. Seems quite over designed, yes. There we go. <laughs> yes, all these fuckers is genuine NASA terminology for your main lifting engines. I am surprised that it did not collapse during the initial physics engine firing up well. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Jeb, like I, I will let you fly this one. This is quite Jeb craft. This this was made for you. <laughs> okay, I do have no idea where the throttle should be to keep this thing stable, so we'll just play it by ear. Launch! All right, we're listing to the side fairly dramatically, quite early. That's that's a concern. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. my! That's a lot of tilt. Okay. That's, that's, uh, mm, yes, we can. We almost we're spinning a little bit as well. I see. Very good. Mm. All right. We, we've re-established up, and spinning should stabilize us. All right. There's the SRBs down, and uh, the first stage liquid engines are still going. Let's push harder, since we stopped accelerating after the SRBs went out, we should continue to accelerate. And we have... I think we've all actually even managed to incline ourselves toward the heat. Okay, discard stage one, good. And we've even managed to f stumble our way into pointing vaguely east, which is good. That's the preferable direction for escape. Uh, you want to go into, you want to go with the rotation of the planet, because then you get a free like 200, 300 meters yeah. per second. Yeah, of course. That makes sense. So I'm gonna continue attempting to lean into that a little bit at a time. Spinning continues to stabilize us. Good. Appears that we have succeeded at that uh, decoupler testing contract. Yes, good. Excellent. So, those engines burn out shortly. There they go. And now we are on our way. So, we have plenty of fuel in this main. The main set the core fucker there. And we are working our way to. Steady 90 degree over trajectory. Alright, let's, let's 
kick in the stabilizer for what little it's worth and take a look at our maths out here in space. Oh good, we will exit the atmosphere on this course and we are continuing to gain valuable space numbers. I'm very surprised that worked. Oh jeez. Science in progress. This is all, it's a space program. We got all kinds of expertise at work here. Uh, pop up the nav ball so I can do... If it wasn't Jeb fly flying that thing, it would have crashed. Do some course correcting while we're up here, so... Only he understands that garbage. <laughs> uh, gonna, gonna tone down the engine here, just for the sake of... I, I like keeping my orbits relatively low, because they technically involve less energy. And, escape the atmosphere succeeded. We have reached space. We are... In space! So we gotta get up to about 2.2 kilometers per second in order to achieve orbit at most close to Kerbin altitudes. So right now our goal is to just work on getting that much lateral velocity shumbled up. We got a minute and a half before we hit our apoapse, so I'm just gonna take it easy on that front. And now, okay, those side tanks that I used for decoupling have remained full. So I'm actually going to gamble on being able to bring their fuel into the center and burn it. Even though that's going to leave me a little bit lopsided for short spans of time. I believe that we can compensate for this. Or, okay, cut the engine. We'll, we'll turn the engine off. Finish dumping the fuel into the core. <laughs> um. And then turn the engine back on. This is how we will solve the problems. We have a minute and a half before we reach peak, so we've got plenty of time to shuffle all this fuel over. In you go. Just siphon it out. Step by step. Yeah, may as well shut off the stabilizer since we're going to need to do some manual realigning to get us pointing in the right direction again. Camera angles, I need one of them that will provide me the appropriate information here. Uh, you, you are, you are not empty. So, let's pump out of you. Get there, you, you. Okay, so the entire front ring has been successfully drained. Let's work on the rear ring. And we have wobbled our way back to facing in mostly the right direction. Good. <laughs> Orbital wobble, it's a, it's a physics term that, that means things. We're, we're highly oh, scientific yes. here at, at the Kerbal Program. Everybody in. Inject all fuel into the thing that's in line with the center of thrust. Very important. Okay, that's all been drained, so now... We have, as a, as a baseline ability to maneuver, we have uh, reaction wheels that are installed in all command modules, so we always have a basic ability to rotate in space. Let's, let's relight the engine and begin. Of course, once you have very large, ungainly craft and need them to spin quickly, you start needing to install other systems, either more reaction wheels, which consume electricity, which right now the only means of generating electricity we have is when our main engine is lit, it will it will produce some voltage for us. Otherwise, we're, we're on the on the line for battery storage. And we are we're actually now slightly descending. However, we can correct for that using science. We are well on our way to entering an orbit. Solar panels unlock several steps down. The Orbit is nearly orbit. We're working on it. Whoop, there's a periaps. Hello, little guy. Look at that. We are nearly. I could just thrust a little more and have ourselves a nice oblong, no longer trapped in atmosphere. Just, there we go. A little more. A little more. Yes, there we go. Uh, Kerbin's atmosphere ends 75 kilometers up. Once you cross that, you enter true space. Okay. So, 
we have established orbit. That was another one of our contracts for massive piles of space bucks. So now, while we're up here in space, look at the sun. Look at the sun from space. It's quite beautiful. Oh, very nice. All right. So now let's conduct some science. Let us observe goo. Observe mystery goo. Interesting. So yes, there's a, we have a preview there of how much of the goo in orbit science we have collected from one experiment. And as a thing you can do logistics-wise, if we had installed an antenna on this spacecraft, you can transmit and send a fraction of the science value you've received back to the base immediately without needing to return the craft. Mm -hmm. But there are limits on how much how much science you can collect via transmission. And as you can see from that bar, there are actually multiple goo tests worth of science in orbit, just with diminishing returns. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna goo twice. This is the first time we've been to space. We'll also collect just general reports. The sky seems to be mostly below us. And have Jeb pop out the door and just kind of take a look around. I could have him do a little bit of EVAing. He just comes with, with five units of jetpack fuel and that lasts for quite a bit of DV. However, I would not want to do that while the ship is rotating. Docking with a rotating thing is really, really irritating. I would want to halt that rotation before engaging in any fiddling around, which can be done easily by way of time accelerator, because if you kick in any amount of time compression, then uh, physics ceases to occur, which means that shift that you have in focus will just lock on to whatever direction it was pointing and just remain there. It is now fixed on this vector of pointing that away ish so we have wound up on the night side of the planet. Sure. I think once we get around to dawn, I might have Jeb poke his head out again and look around. So a thing about uh, science, there, you only get one crew report per module. If we wanted to get a different report, we would have to destroy the data that we already have in there from the crew report. However, the EVA reports that you can do if you have the astronaut set out, their capacity to take measurements and so forth gets reset every time they stop off in the capsule. They drop off their data and can then take mm -hmm. fresh measurements elsewhere. It's one of the advantages of bringing a manned crew along with you. You have this renewable science tool that is your astronaut. And so, for example, during these, these orbital missions, I've already done orbit, but I could, when we go back into the upper atmosphere, have them briefly poke out, and then again in lower atmosphere, again after we've landed. If we land on land, I could have him take surface samples. Not that I see much reason that a space program would benefit from collecting dirt from their own planet, mm -hmm. but if you want to, you can. It's still worth something. You can take surface okay. samples of your own runway, and it's still worth a little bit of science. <laughs> Just come home with a bucket of asphalt. Here you go. I explored. Good job, Jim. <laughs> Actually, since I have plenty of fuel, I think something I'm going to do for the benefit of this mission is, uh, once we get, I'm gonna get us back around to our periaps again, and then I am just going to jones all of that fuel into boosting the size of this orbit, and see if we can get some high orbit data from the other end. We'll be able to do that by just poking our head out, being like, yep, we're in even more space. And then I'll just use the remaining fuel from the main section for boosting out, and then the fuel from the upper section will be used for deorbiting us safely. Well, the parachute is mostly what will cause us to deorbit safely in the end, but the, the engine will help. It'll let us choose where and when we want to strike the Earth. Alright, so what I just did there out on the map, I'm gonna cut down time exactly. Well, no, it's 18 minutes away. So what I did there is, the thing you can do in Kerbal, this is a maneuver code. What you can do is you can slap one of those down somewhere on your current path, and then you use these vectors here to plan a change in speed. And it will project out for you what that would result in, and tell you on your nav ball here 
which way you need to burn and for how long and when to accomplish the thing you're trying to do. So now we have this bar here that is, I've planned a 762 meter per second burn, which is probably more than what we have in fuel right now, but whatever, we'll get some fraction of that once we get there. In 14 minutes, purple time, which can of course be accelerated down to something vaguely reasonable. Oh, I was going to drop to regular time so that I can establish control of the ship and point myself at this blue dot here that is the vector of your current maneuver node that you have planned. This is point here to do thing. So I'm just going to drop us on there for convenience, and so when eight Kerbal minutes pass, we will be in position to do our thing. If we were trying to do anything, you know, grand and fancy and precise with our space travel, rather than just the current degree of fucking around, and this again another technical NASA term, this broad class of space missions, fucking around. Of course. Then uh, there's there's some stuff Very you, important. you would do around. In particular, a thing you do with the maneuver nodes is you start your burn half of the duration of the burn before the time and then carry on to like half the duration afterwards because of course your maneuver node there assumes i would be able to instantaneously change speed right. completely at that exact point which will not happen ever practically because whoa, whoa whoa hold on hold on it turns out i had more than what i thought and we're gonna go super far great let's be sure that we keep this under control which is actually quite easy because we're I'm throwing us up into a big ol' ellipse, whose periaps is still way the fuck down here right next to the atmosphere. So returning from this is really easy. Almost trivial. I could- if things went absolutely wrong, I could, at the right moments, have Jeb get out and push, and it would put us on a safe return trajectory. <laughs> we could- uh, we, we have enough that we could- we could reach Mun orbit, not that we are in the right position to actually intercept Mun, but we can... We, we, it's a proof of concept. This is a Mun's worth of fuel. We have Mun capable DV right now, as you can see. That'll... We're gonna spend a whole two days in space now because of this dumb idea. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps more. We can, we can try for more. We can push, even harder. Push the limits of Kerbal Space Endurance. At 13,000 kilometer, 14,000, so we are currently in the process of benefiting from uh, a brief actual, actual science thing, the Oberth effect. It is a rocketry thing whereby, in so the deeper we are in a gravity well, the more efficient our use of fuel will be. Essentially, the faster you are moving, the more use you get out of further change in speed. And in an orbit, you are always moving at your fastest, at your lowest point. So by, by burning our engine down here, even tiny little nudges are giving us millions of meters in altitude on our giant ellipse. We're, we're pushing out past the reach of Minmas now. The other moon. The Min moon. 20 days. For 20 days in space! Well, and still very easy to return because our periaps, we're going to still come within 80,000, we're going to come within 80 kilometers of the planet, we're going to be right next to the atmosphere. Only minimal course correction is necessary to make this return. Okay, there we go. We've expended all of the lower section's fuel and achieved a peak apoapse of 57 million meters. Let us space. In 24 days, sure. 24 days to get back. We're we're gonna have Jeb spend a month in space. This is one of those moments where I could choose to go launch another different mission while waiting for this one to complete. No, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna see this one through, Jeb. 
You made your bed. Considering what a fucking mess the original rocket was, it's very surprising that this worked. We are gonna set all kinds of records. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I just had him uh, collect some data from that it was uh, it's, uh, space above Kerbin's oceans. Okay, that's. Uh, that's another thing. So the, the the planets themselves, they will have all kinds of different biomes you can science over. So it's, it's there, I suppose, as a mechanism for if you're having trouble getting out to new places, you can still harness more science by just doing variations on a mission you've already accomplished. There's a lot of science you could get by just bumbling around on Kerbin if you wanted to build planes or survivable ballistic missiles or so forth. What do you mean I can't store this experiment? Board anyway. Oh, maybe they did create a capacity limit for how much EVA data we can throw in here. Hmm. Well, in that case... In that case, I'll ditch this, obviously, because we're going to get a much more valuable report once we're out in, in huge space. Way the fuck over there, out beyond the moons. So, yeah, scrap that one. That's not important. It's like 8 bits. Why did you only bring one tape, Jeb? Nah. You're going to space and you only brought the one tape? Alright, time excel, let's go. To the depths. Farewell, planet. We... we must go now. <laughs> There's a lot of impact craters on Kerbin. Like, like, big geological ones like that fucker there. Lots of stuff has hit Kerbin in its past. Implicitly, at least. Uh, so the other thing is, once I discard this, it's going to stay in our huge fuck-off gigantic orbit here and just be debris that lives here forever. Oh yeah, we still have something that we can discard. Yep, we have all mm. of that from, from here back. That's going to be jettisoned off. And the thing is, uh, the decoupler actually applies a bit of force to it. So it'll actually end up in a in a slightly different orbit. And I'm vaguely thinking that maybe if I took it all the way out here and pushed it in the right direction, I might jones it into a, fl into a path that'll bring it back into the atmosphere and then eventually dispose of it. Which would be nuts. The, the, <laughs> the, just the space dunk of throwing this thing back to the planet. But I, I don't mind that. We should keep this here. This is we, we need to leave something from the tax fraud mission in commemoration of this great moment. This is a part of our history going on right now. Right, so let's, let's time warp down a little bit so I can orient myself. Just set us spinning a little. Which costs a little bit of battery, but we have plenty of battery to work with. We have no passive draw on our battery right now. We don't have anything that consumes the electricity, so we're just gonna give ourselves a nice leisurely spin around. Once we are facing retrograde, our, our little green markers here on the nav ball, those are those are the two points that are along our current velocity vector. This fellow here three points, that's our retrograde vector, it's, it's the opposite of where we're going, and then the, the four-point open circle is the prograde vector, which way we are going. They're two very important navigation things for, for space. Right, so let's jettison that. Off on your way, you, you majestic thing, you, you assemblage of science parts. You very, very expensive object, you. Godspeed. Alright, so that's off on its way. We can check the map, and it will. Well, here we are in Tax Fraud 1. I suppose we're not far enough away from it yet for it to show up as a distinct object, or maybe. Am I not tracking debris? Alright, let's turn on debris. I had debris switched off for things to keep track of. There's a bunch of. of old debris that still exists back on the, on the planet. I suppose that's those girders just still existing out in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> yes, girders. 
the girders, another monument to Carpal Science. Alright, and uh, the Tax Fraud, which has a just about identical to us orbital path. Uh, let, me, let me select the Tax Fraud. I could switch to controlling the Tax Fraud if I really wanted to. Now we are this pile of debris that we can't attempt to use in any way because it has no engines, no fuel, no power, no means of rotation, no command module. It's just debris. But we can focus on it if we really want to. It is completely empty, so it's periaps. Yeah, it's, it's not in the, gonna hit the atmosphere. It's gonna just live out here in space. All right, back to tax fraud one. Jeb, how you doing? Good. Yeah, you're good. All right. So now time. So let's watch the former boost section drift off into the distance. Someday, that day may never come, that is going to ram into someone in very substantial velocity. <laughs> On that day, it will be born again as insurance fraud one. <laughs> Alright, let's, let's accelerate. Let's get the hell out there. So each of these notches is progressively much larger than the others to be useful for long space travel. Also, by the way, this uh, this day measure here, uh, Kerbal days are actually six hours long. So it's not as it's it's Kerbal. It's, it's going to be a couple of weeks of human time, Earth time. Okay. It's not so bad. So let, let's kick her up to ten thousand times actual speed of time. And, uh, nearly out to the peak. And about to be demonstrated, well, already being thoroughly demonstrated is another thing about orbital mechanics, so we, we move the fastest at the lowest point in our orbit and the slowest at the highest point in our orbit, which means in, a, in an, obs an as obscenely eccentric orbit at this one is the difference between the thousands of meters per second we were moving down there and 60. And it's going to get even lower way the hell up here. Yeah, down to, down to, down to 42. Down to really fucking slow. And there are properties of that that we can exploit for all kinds of orbital maneuvers. For example, if we wanted to rotate this orbit and change its plane, that would be most efficiently done from out here, because we only need to cancel 40 meters per second this way and then reestablish a new speed in some mm -hmm. other direction. Whereas if we were trying to do it down at the bottom, that would be ridiculous. Alright, so now that we are way the hell out here, let's get our unprecedented EVA report of of the deep space. Look at space, isn't it gorgeous? Look at how tiny the planet is. We have gone so far. So goddamn far. Wait, it's still just where they it still just counts as over the ocean. Jeb! I'm not sure you understand <laughs> the significance of this moment, Jeb. Alright, I guess you don't get better Kerbal, Kerbin EVA reports until we actually leave the Kerbin system and end up out here in space. By the way, meteors. Meteors are a thing. You can, they're out there. You can, you can find them and poke them and attempt to maneuver them around into striking other things eventually. That is a great possibility. So, and another thing about being way the fuck out here is... Tiny changes in speed out here can have drastic effects on how our path will look when we get back down to the low side. So I'm just gonna orient myself here. And attempt to get an eye on our periaps. Which is, there we go, 79 kilometers. Uh, Leaf stabilizer on. Oh, I didn't light the final engine yet. Let's let's do that. So anyway, back out here on the map. Alright, we have now placed our path back inside the atmosphere. 
63, 60, let's aim for 50 something kilometers. I'm going to engage in some arrow breaking entirely frivolously because we have so much goddamn. We didn't even use a full unit of fuel to do that, but we are now on our return course. Entire grams of fuel were spent putting us on our safe return trajectory <laughs> from way the fuck out here in fucking nowhere space. Now, what will happen as we pass the crest of our upper orbit and begin our descent into into non-space? We're gonna fall way the hell back down there, skim through the atmosphere, bleeding off a whole bunch of speed. And at the altitude we're falling from, we're definitely gonna skip back out of that atmosphere and come around for another pass. But by doing this, we will be able to deorbit ourselves from all of this energy we put into our orbit, we're, we can cancel out of this for free. This is one of the great advantages of arriving at a thing with an atmosphere is very easy. All you have to do is get very close to it and then physics sorts everything out for you. Leaving things with atmospheres is a little bit more annoying, as is how every, every Kerbal Space mission will traditionally begin. Without, oh, hey. Briefly have earned ourselves a min miss encounter. We briefly could have had ourselves a min miss encounter. I think we've had enough of triumph or agony. Pick, pick one or the other, but. <laughs> so, yeah. Just leave that album on over here. This is, this is on theme for space. Okay. Alright, and I would like to put us down on land, ultimately, once we are done with all of this. And I'd like to put us down today-ish, so I'm going to use all of our gigantic goddamn fuel reserve to help expedite this process. We briefly would have had a moon encounter if we had committed onto that, but whatever. So I'm just gonna bleed all of this back down to a reasonable orbital period. Get us within, like, a Kerbal hour of, of orbit. Cut the orbit down to a reasonable duration, then coast out to the top in order to sink our periapse deeper into the atmosphere. Actually, fuck that noise. We'll just continue to decelerate and aim to eventually bring ourselves down maybe somewhere in this desert. That seems like a vaguely feasible goal. Let's just point to Horizon. So right now we are ascending again, we're pulling back out of the atmosphere, but we're continuing to be dragged. But yes, this is highly feasible. Path is coming down nicely. It's very high efficiency engine, it's doing good things for us in terms of altering speed. All kinds of meters on that. So now... We now have a suborbital path. Way the hell over there. Now let's just work on hooking all of this back around and drop us Return from space. In progress. Back out of the atmosphere again, which is handy. And yeah, let's call it there. So that is an arc. That right now it projects a course that puts us way the hell over there, but that 
does not and cannot. I have no mods in place. This is vanilla 0.24. Right now we have a trajectory that puts us out in the edge of that desert there. However, that cannot account for atmospheric drag, so... And we're, we're gonna hit the soup around... around there. So at, the, at the soup level of atmosphere, that's just when we start moving towards dead drop, and before that there's gonna be more drag once we get around... around here-ish, so we're probably looking at landing around the edge of the desert there. Vaguely. If we had built this thing to be some sort of aerodynamic vessel, then you'd have a lot of flexibility and be able to drop yourself anywhere once you hit the atmosphere, because we're just gonna glide remarkably far. But we're just we're just capsule, so going to ride this out to the end. Let's just do it live. We have now re-entered the atmosphere. Descending steadily. I feel like starting up the engine. Just that you may as well take the fuel and put it to work. Rather than just letting it sit stagnant. Fuel wants to be burned. So we're just gonna let it contribute to bringing us a nice leisurely towards the planet. Does she have a nice view of this? Let's, let's take a look here. This, uh, yeah, all the flight instruments inside of here are actually connected to. They are displaying the same information that we would get outside. These lights status display indicator things, and uh, we actually have an additional instrument inside the cockpit that doesn't exist outside the radar altimeter, which is very useful for landing. This tells you the actual physical distance between you and the ground beneath your feet, starting at 3,000 meters in terms of maximum range. It's helpful because the altitude that you get on the outside, that is versus sea level, which is a very vague concept when applied to planets that don't have bodies of water. the burning off of fuels are now. If we're in the like the mid soup almost to the deep soup. So we're getting our re-entry effects. Still non-lethal. Shiny. Just get to watch your thing dynamically be on fire. Uh, by casting shadows. Actually, nearly stopped our descent completely and started going back up, which is the opposite of what we're trying to do right now. So, thanks, Jeb. Uh, yeah, put some of our speed back in us. We can orchestrate finishing off the rest of this fuel. Okay, fuel burnt, engine jettisoned, and parachute is go. I would 
worry about landing on that, but it's probably going to atomize when it hits the ground. Oh, there it goes. And now we know how far away the surface is. Valuable <laughs> scientific data. Well, we also have our radar altimeter informing us. Quite comfortable inside the tube. lovely view of nothing out this very tiny window. Some of the other command modules have much nicer windows than let you see things. This one does not. Just a single itty bitty square on the door that you used to verify that your door is not pointed at at dirt or ocean or nothing. It's not much of a window. Eventually we'll unlock the more better command pods that contain many kerbals weigh a lot, so they require large engines to push them around. Weigh a lot. A lot. And we're down. How many is a lot? Four, eight, twelve? Three is the largest of them. That's in vanilla. Don't, don't, don't back in, Jeb. We want you to... Yes, let go. Take a walk. Stand proud. Here, as we have landed in the deserts the name of the owls. Winter Owl. There we go. Take a report. Space suit was entirely necessary for this. Surface sample. We have successfully collected sand. Great. Space mission accomplished. Let's go home. They can set us wobbling while we're waiting for the parachutes to look at all those cords. It's Someday they might make parachutes be capable of tangling it with each other, and that will be a terrifying time, because then this monstrosity <laughs> will yeah. work. Of just look at this kaleidoscope. That is that's beautiful. That's that deserves, fascinating. Yeah. That deserves a change of tune. I gotta find something Symmetry goes as high as 10 or 16 potential objects, but they won't let you place them in their intersection. As many as I can fit on a thing this size would need a fatter rocket or a mount of parachutes in a deeper rig. But yeah, we got, we got the kaleidoscopic braking system here. Here we are, at sea. We're a boat now, Dudley. 